to Princeton University um, and thank you so much to the organizers um, of the Queer Asia Conference. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, there's no photography, filming, recording, um, otherwise you've explicit, unless you've gotten explicit permission from the uh, organizers. So please be respectful of that. Um, there's the hashtag, uh, hashtag QueerAsia2017. So feel free. Um, yeah, okay. That's, that's it for housekeeping. Um, our first of our three panelists today is um, Yaroslav Volobov who uh, is currently an assistant curator at the Garage Museum of Contemporary Art in Moscow. Uh, he took a, a BA in Indian Studies at St. Petersburg in Russia um, and also took an MA in Curatorial Studies at Bard College, New York. Um, he's going to speak to us today um, a paper entitled Black, South Asian and Queer, Muntaz, Kanji and Bothering the Viewer. Please welcome. Um, Please welcome our panelists. Hello. Uh, how do I do that one? Okay, good. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, candidly speaking, it's a little bit unnerving to be the first speaker in this section and stand before this august assembly. <laughs> uh, as a way of preamble, I wanted to thank the organizers very much for their hospitality and for their excellent management of what I'm sure will and already is a uh, successful and highly stimulating conference. Um, in this paper, I'm going to showcase the emergence of the queer visual strand within the insurgent discourse of late 1980s black art in Britain. In so doing, I will make an attempt to redress a lingering lacuna shaped by the scarceness in the analytical record of attention paid to the works of Mumtaz Karimji, a singular most under-examined and virtuosic artist in black British art. <clears throat> Apart from taking the risk of approaching the Yoning Abyss, um, that is the black queer art in Britain, these people will highlight and examine aesthetic strategies and visual devices employed by the artist. The decade of the 1980s held it a palpable change in the British art scene, which by the time had been drastically afflicted by the notion of ostensibly impermeable white British identity, um, the hegemony of which had been ushered in by Thatcherism. This decade foregrounded the arrival uh, of a new conglomerate of disparate artistic potencies, that is to say the emergence of black arts or uh, Afro-Asian arts, or one of the artists, uh, namely Rashid Arain, would call this, uh, this conglomerate of uh, artistic potencies, as I said. Here it should be mentioned that by the beginning of the 1980s, this notion came to replace the so-called minority arts, which had previously encompassed such notions as uh, Afro-Caribbean, West Indian, Asian arts, which had been used as separate um, entities. And uh, this appellation, black arts, was also and is a self-chosen identification uh, for the artist, and by all means is a political rather than a phenotypical category, as many scholars uh, argue. Uh, here are some of the artist quotes that I'd love to mention here. So one of them is from Rashid Arain. He's a Pakistani-British post-conceptual artist. So in one of his interviews, he said, it's only now that we know that people from Indian subcontinent are also black people. Thank heaven for the racism of this country. It made Indians discover that they are also black. And another quote come from a, a prominent group exhibition called Crossing Black Waters. It drew on the concept of uh, Kalipana, which is Kalipana, which is black black water in uh, Hindi. Uh, so it, it's, it goes as when we use the term black, we use it as a political term. It doesn't describe skin color. It defines our situation here in Britain, where here, as a result of British imperialism <laughs> and our continued oppression in Britain, is the result of the British racism. Um, as Britain in the 90s was living through an upsurge in subversive creativity education, uh, activism, and curatorial undertake undertakings. These are some of the major exhibitions back in the 90s and 80s that were organized by, uh, organized by black women artists. This is uh, five black women. Another one was Black Women Time Now, and the theme, Black Line, 
Uh, mostly all of them were organized by Lubaina Hamid. I think she is now nominated for Turner Prize, or I think she is, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so as this uh, was unfolding, many black female artists still had to confront the rigid structural barriers of parochial patriarchism. Um, for black and Asian British women, identity construction has been an even more pressing task than for men, uh, for they have to cope not only with positioning themselves in a relation to the hegemonic culture and with marginalization as ethnic others, but also with discrimination as women in a male-dominated society, and this include black as well, white men. And um, here is one of the um, like memories of female contemporaries of the artists that I'm going to talk about, Mumtaz Karamji. She said, the British media is particularly fond of portraying Asian women as submissive playmates full of Eastern promise. Um, this situation would expectedly become um, <coughs> markedly more complex when a non-heteronormative sexuality was at work, which, as uh, Sunil Gupta, a prominent uh, gay photographer, uh, from Canada, but with Indian background, argues became visible with the emergence of polit politics of representation. So he said that lesbian and gay artists have been with us since the invention of representation, but it is only since the emergence of the politics of, rep of representation that they have been allowed to participate in the cultural agenda. Uh, in this context, photography, and I mean photography as a medium, uh, was, and I guess still is, in the very vanguard of the struggle for visibility and representation. Um, as Pati Pa Parma, a uh, prominent film scholar, uh, says, the photographic work by black women has been a significant part of emergent black cultural practice. It has sought to rework and reinscribe the language and conventions of representation, not simply to articulate our cultural difference, but to strive beyond this and develop a narrative that is wholly encased within our own terms of reference. Um, so now I will go on to the artist, the photographer that I, I'm showcasing in my paper, Mumtaz Karamji. Um, being female, gay, and South Asian, she represents the whole gamut of non-dominant identities. As such, her use of photography, weaving together the skeins of feminism, post-coloniality, and queerness, contributed to the medium becoming a pivotal in the LGBT imagery, as we just said. Okay, we will look into one of her works in particular and we'll address its philosophy and the way the image is engineered. Uh, this photographic piece on lesbian sexuality and identity is called In Search of an Image, 1991. And um, Sunil Gupta, who's been mentioned before, uh, described this piece within a larger series of her works, which were presented like this. Uh, she made a piece in which she assembled images of herself in a search of an identity. The piece is very culture-specific. Three landscape uh, format, black and white self-portraits in Muslim dress, arranged vertically opposite three self-portraits in a region of Western lesbian stands around the central image of herself, covering under a tree. You can see it better. <coughs> Text accompanies each photograph beginning with the, the Eastern disease as the first and Western disease is, is the last. The other images uh, gave quotes from Western travelers describing Eastern lesbian women within the classic framework of lesbianism, uh, I'm sorry, orientalism, and powerful quotes from lesbian feminist writers. Uh, this piece is a direct challenge to cultures that have historically sought to blame the other for the habit uh, of homosexuality. Uh, Muntaz Karimji herself describes it as a piece that explores the racism, sexism, and homophobia of the white dominant society in which I li she lives, and sexism and homophobia of the society into which she was born. The work deconstructs both Western and South Asian views of lesbianism and uses self-portraiture with text juxtaposing the Western stereotype view of lesbianism as a disease emanating from the erotic oriental woman. With the Eastern view of my community, she says, that homosexuality is a disease of Western decadence. I pick my way uh, between the two, sifting through and reshaping the ground I walk upon, building the foundations of a self-defined identity. <coughs> As we can see, um, in Karimji's work, it is the personal experience, rather than formal art training, that forms both her individual artistic politics and poetics, which are both linked to the complexity of an individual destiny. Therefore, her lesbian identity should not be overlooked as dynamic in her life and her art. So let us look closer at the image right now. 
and try to flesh out um, the visual devices that the artists employ here. Um, one of them that I uh, will uh, draw upon is masquerading, and uh, masquerading is a decolonizing tool. I use this term um, as it described in Han Sherlin, uh, doctoral thesis postcolonial masquerading. Masquerading in this context refers to the donning of costumes, makeup, and the use of props in staging one's own body before the camera lens. So in this photograph, Montaz Karimji uses her swathed body as a prop, staging it in a phantasmagoric oriental ambience, invoking an almost nostalgic colonial spectacle in making the orientalist ideology resurface. Um, likewise, European painters of the <coughs> 19th century turned to backdrops of harems and baths to invoke, to invoke an atmosphere of non-European hedonism and tantalizing intrigue. Uh, Anger's Anger 1914 La Grande Odalisque, for example, depicts a concubine languidly lounging about, lightly dusting herself with feathers as she peers over her shoulder uh, at the viewer with absent eyes. I would. Um, market here, absent eyes. The, no the notions of hedonistic and indulgent sex are bolstered by hints to opium-induced pleasure offered by the pipe in the bottom right corner. Images like this prompted viewers to imagine the East as a distant region of sex, inebriance, and exciting exotic experiences. Um, as Edward Said famously argued, that the West uses the East as an inverted mirror, imagining them to be everything the West is not. And this Orientalist painting is a classic example of it. I believe that we can regard uh, this photograph by Montaz as a hermeneutic retake on ori Orientalist painting. Um, Montaz doesn't use the masquerade here to hide her more phallic images. Mm -hmm. This is something a woman subject would, according to British psychoanalysts, do. Uh, uh, it's a very famous article by Riviere Joan called Womanless is a Mas Masquerade. And uh, I actually think that the openly articulated artist sexuality here confuses the relations of the roles of women as subject and object. And to use a snappy expression from famous lesbian anthology, stolen glances, uh, lesbian take photographs, Muntaz is hijacking the heteronormative spaces. And this is the harem that has the real, that, that has the role of this uh, phantasmic beacon of heteronormativity that is being hijacked, appropriated and re-semanticized by the artist who places her recalcitrant, black, and political body at the kernel of the patriarchal heteronormative iconography. Uh, do I still have time? Um, so as I've been quoted already, Pratik uh, um black artist and a film scholar and a film director, she uh, said in one of her interviews uh, how she implemented the female gaze in her film Khush, I think it's happiness in Hindi. Uh, she says, uh, I use it as a strategy of subverting the gaze, of turning the gaze around it and saying we're spectators of our own images, we're spectators we want to be. So here in this photograph, uh, we can clearly see a direct, active gaze towards the viewer as it is contrasted with the one I have just described in the uh, La Grande Odalisque by Anger. Uh, we can call it the oppositional black female gaze, as Bell Hooks, an American author, feminist, and social activist, uh, coined it, coins it. The oppositional gaze that redirects and misleads the viewer's gaze and desire. So for me, this work is a sort of a new iconography, a clad odalisque in a sense, uh, with an active gaze. These two visual and performative devices can be regarded as an analytical procedure of querying not only the artsily heteronormative iconography, but is querying the viewer's eyes, enabling the artist to remain in control of her own image and revert the ethnographic male gaze. This work invo invokes invoked subversive female subjectivity not only to self-articulate and vocalize a story from the excluded margins, but also to authorize a black lesbian domain within the energetically unfolding history of black British art. This work has effectively projected the reclaiming of power over the colonized visual histories of the other. <coughs> Thank you. We'll have the papers first, and then if you could hold your questions, we'll do a Q&A after all three. Um, I'm going to give you five minutes and two minutes. 
so I don't mind. Um, Um, our next speaker is Sahil Tandon. He is uh, institutionally affiliated with CREA in India. He's a young developmental practitioner. He has a background in developmental policy and focuses on issues pertaining to gender, um, which is the work that he does at CREA. Um, and he also serves as um, program coordinator there for the Gage Learning Academy. Um, he has a uh, rich family history um, uh, with Hindustani classical music, which is the subject of his paper today. Um, and uh, it's through coming uh, through that tradition uh, that he has started to explore questions of uh, uh, identity pertaining to queerness, sexuality, and gender. Uh, so the title of his paper today is Um, Queering Indo Indian Classical Music, An Exploration of Sexuality and Desire. Thank you very much. Um. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, so um, before getting into the subject of the presentation, I think on the outset I'd like to clarify my approach to the theme of the conference, Queer Asia. I see queer more as an approach and perspective than an identity. And I think it's that approach that I have also applied to my analysis and my study of Indian classical music or Hindustani music as we commonly know it. Um, knowing queering as an understanding of identity and to explain non-normative expressions of gender and sexuality is also to understand power dynamics within the diverse range of ideo identities and ideologies that reflect on social and historical conce concepts and constructs. So I think that's the basis of how I approach Indian classical music. Um, before going into the study of Hindustani music, I will try to quickly explain what Hindustani music signifies and means. Hindustani is a socio-cultural, geopolitical identifier term and not just something Indian as we all may understand it to be. Hindustani music is an ancient artistic tradition that dates back to the early Vedic periods, which is around 1500 BC. Uh, so I think it's probably one of the first structured forms of music and art in the world. Much of that structure continues to remain even today, and all transformations that have happened in the art form have been built on the structures and conventions that were laid down as early as the Samveda in 1500 BC. In the Sunni music has transformed through the ages, imbibing and amalgamating with external forces and traditions into what we know now as in the Sunni music. Just like any other musical form, Hindustani music too is based on the structure of beats and notes, tal and sur. What is however distinctive of this art form is the structure of the rags and the compositions that go with them. Over the ages, as I mentioned, Hindustani music has transformed a lot, taking in from the conquests and the invasions of the Persian and C Central Asian invaders in the medieval era, and the dominant style sung today came about to be known as the khayal. Khayal literally means imagination, and it's a, it's a form based predominantly on the artist's impro improvisations and artistic imagination. Khayal brought in a new way of expressionism, allowing absolute impro improvisation to the artist within the strict structures of the rags. The content of the music, as we all may know, notes could be argued to be naturally occurring. Notes do not need human intervention to exist. However, the content of an art form, especially a musical form, is the lyrics and the structuring of the compositions. In India, in Hindustani music, that is known as the bandish. The bandish literally means binding together and is the vehicle on which a composition or a style of singing is performed. My, my paper uh, explores musical content in the form of these bandishes, which are traditional compositions dating back to the 17th and 18th centuries, on how they expressed and reflected the constructs of gender and sexuality through those times and have continued to do so and reproduce those in the art form that continues even today. Um, 
The Bandesh, as I said, are tra traditional com compositions that have been passed down throughout artistic traditions and lineages of Hindustani music, from the guru to the student, the guru shishya parampara, as we call it in India. What is interesting to note is the Bandesh are not always, are almost always from the feminine perspective, the naika, the actor, the charming lady. The feminine singing for the masculine, expressing a range of emotions of pathos, pining, pleasure, passion. But the Bandish is always structured as a human perspective of the feminine. The Bandish reflects on social patriarchal values and the dichotomy between the incomplete and weak feminine and the supreme subject of all desire, the absolute and powerful masculine. I refrain from saying female and male because the same compositions are sung by female and male artists but the construction of the power dynamics and the unequal identities is between the feminine and the masculine. These themes reproduce and reinforce the unequal power relations between the feminine and the masculine that was seen historically and socially through an art form and the tradition of Hindustani music. One of the most prominent themes of these compositions that we see is of the jilted and the heartbroken feminine. This is something that is seen almost in all compositions of the feminine singing at the departure or the adultery of her lover, her husband, who leaves her for a new lover, a younger lover, the sotan as we know it. Expressions of pathos, heartbreak and rejection and an ex extreme desire for the masculine who completes the feminine without the masculine presence and the masculine energy. The feminine is expressed as an, in as an incomplete, helpless entity the feminine Naika expresses de desire and unfulfilled sexuality since she has now been left by the masculine. This is probably one of the first expressions of sexuality so explicitly that we see in Indian culture, especially for the feminine and for the female. Going to the ne next theme is again similar but not so same. The restless and unsettled masculine in absentia. This talks about a very historical trend that we knew of in India of men leaving their homes to go away for work or for travels and that conveys a sense of incompleteness again another common theme where the feminine spining yearning and anxiety for the masculine is expressed the masculine may, mo may not be an adulterer but him just being absent can throw the feminine and the female in grief and anguish the longing of the feminine the desire of ex the, and the expression of desire is much more than an expression of love for the masculine. It is a pain that is internalized, questioning the identity of the feminine, making her restless and troubled, her desires unfulfilled without the masculine presence. While Hindustani music maintains an absolutely Puritan stance, sexuality and indulgence is allowed for the masculine. The masculine in the bandish is depicted often as an adulterer who finds new lovers and leaves the feminine for his passion and his desire. Although the unequal power relations between the masculine and feminine are evident, there are instances of bandish where the feminine calls out to her lover, retorts at his adultery. This one bandish, which is a very common one, translating it literally would be, why do you now come to my doorstep after st staying through the night with your lover in passion and pleasure? O Manrang, which is a pseudonym of the author of the composition, don't come to me, go back to your young lover with whom you found love. These are explicit references again of desire and sexuality, of adultery, where a feminine is shown so helpless, is so, shown so incomplete as the all source of desire, all source of pleasure to her life and to her existence lies with the masculine. While these are mostly the common themes of Hindustani music, this one particular composition is quite an exceptional one. The author of the composition is not known, but it dates back to the early, to the late 19th century. And this is one that I wanted to put out. If I translate it directly, it means you have never given me the beetle leaf or the cigarette, two, two common habits which are considered very masculine. I have been asking these for you from you for so long. They tempt me, O oh lover. The cigarette rolled by your hand, colourful and pleasurable. I have been asking for so long. It tempts me, O oh my lover. What's interesting here, and I think that might be an overinterpretation on my part, but I'll risk it, 
is that while we see a theme of desire for the masculine in most other compositions, this composition shows desire for masculinity. I think this is a singular almost, I, I dare say, instance of the feminine entity expressing the need or the desire to transgress out of the conforms of what femininity means in the Indian context for habits, for taboos, for the forbidden which the masculine has control over. One argument that most artists, most scholars, most musicologists of Hindustani music will give is the God element. Hindustani music is almost sanctimonious. Asking any artist about the undertones of sexuality and desire will prompt a response that all music is only for the divine, the eternal power, and so is devoid of a, and disconnected from any human weaknesses or any human desires. However, even if we assume that this argument stands true, it is interesting to note that even between the relationship of God and human, God gets the masculine stance. God, the masculine, the superior, is God and the subordinate, the feminine, is human. We, Hindustani music has continued to reproduce and reinforce this unequal power paradigm between gender identities or dualities that exist in society and identity. Um, it would be incomplete uh, to look at the content of Hindustani music without looking at the con context within which it lives. Uh, However, it isn't enough to look at the context. I'm sorry, I'm reading notes and trying to speak ex for pardon me. The development of Hindustani music in its current form happened through the medieval ages, in, in a time rife with foreign conquests and invasions of the Indian com subcontinent, which brought with them a plethora of sociocultural diversity in the region and in the arts. The times, uh, this time also sees an emergence of hardly enforced patriarchal and gender regressive norms where heteronormativity and cisgendered identities became the dominant and conventional paradigms of existence and an exa exacerbation of gender segregation and, inequ and inequality was institutionalized. The same historical trends are mirrored in the art form of Hindustani music. As the music of the era developed in a gender segregated system, men had all the control and the access over the art form, while women were constrained and limited away from the art and the traditions of expression. The only exceptions to these are the courtesans and the notch girls, as the British colonialists called them, women entertainers who were not considered respectable who, but who, and was further stigmatized, also leading to the gender segregation of the art forms. Thus, Hindustani music became a male hegemonized and monopolized system. The artists, the teachers, the composers, scholars, patrons, and the audience all were men. Why this point is important, and especially to my lens of querying, is that when we understand that Hindustani music developed in a solely male-dominated arena, it is interesting to note that despite men being the dominant actors, the dominant theme of all the art was desire for the masculine. We can't really comment on the sexualities or gender identities of these artists because of lack of documentation and historical records. But it is a bending of identities and a bending of expression in art where the artists and the audience, especially in a masculine and a patriarchal society, allow and appreciate an, as, an an assumption of the feminine slant in all male artists for expression of desire, for expression of love, for expression of longing. The dichotomy of genders of the artists is what I see as part of this querying, the social gender and the performative gender. While there's not much certainty due to lack of recording of histories, as I said, knowing the dominant historical context and the prevalent traditional content does reveal an unconventional, almost novel understanding of how we see gender and sexuality and the expressions of these in the traditional art form. It is interesting to note that desire was the theme through which all querying in Indian Hindustani art form happened. Thank you.
going to do with your coat? Um, I think I'll be Yeah, 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 of course. I'll just in case. <laughs> yeah. Um, our final speaker is Hans Tomming Huang. Um, he's at the Center of uh, Study of Sexualities and the Department of English at the National Central University in Taiwan. Um, he's the author of a monograph entitled Queer Politics and Sexual Modernity in Taiwan that came out in 2011 at, uh, with Hong Kong University Press. And he's also the editor of uh, three volumes on the cultural politics of AIDS. Um, over to you. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm going to talk about this um, unique person, um, um, the queer lab playwright, um, Taiwanese queer playwright, Tian Qi Yuan. Um, he was the artistic director of Critical Point Theater Phenomenon Troupe, which he founded in 1988. Um, at around the same time, he became the spectacle of AIDS in Taiwan when he was diagnosed with uh, one of the very early patients and it was kind of quarantined by the university. <coughs> but he went on to become uh, a key figure in the little theater movement in post martial law Taiwan. Uh, the movement itself is considered part of the kind of social movement at the time that's erupting. So before his death, he produced over 20 plays. Um, and his theater has been widely regarded as avant-garde, um, challenging the party state regime. Um, and uh, as he was coming to an end, uh, Taiwan, by the way, has the, the world's longest uh, martial law regime of 50 years. Um, but he was also outspoken, his place was also outspoken uh, around, top, around sex and sexuality. But um, strangely enough, um, he's left-wing politics and aesthetics, and also he's kind of imperial, anti-imperialist thrust, um, continue to be neglected due to the ongoing effect of Cold War division. Um, for his left-wing politics, he's very much influenced by Brecht. Um, and I think his third world, um, his, anti, his kind of third worldism is very much in line with the Taiwanese um, left thinker, Chen Yingzhen. And the prevailing trend at the time in Taiwan in uh, around uh, in 19, at the time of post that's the moment of postmodernism. Um, but um, it's easy, you know, it's easy not to look at history with postmodernism. So um, Tian was very critical of the uh, the kind of performing methods and um, theory at the time, which he called the art a cut and paste. Um, and I think he's rather unique in that he's really, he's extremely um, talented and well-read. Um, and he's attentive to conditions of knowledge production and, the, and even formation of Taiwanese and Chinese modernity. Um, so this paper is drawn from um, my reading of uh, his archive manuscripts and play, major plays. Um, I also undertook um, some interviews with the two uh, former troop, mem uh, troop member, and I'm going to show um, Tian Qiyuan's cultural politics by focusing on his engagement with the national culture and with the popular in Chinese cultural tradition, and also to show how question of desire stigma and violence and modernity are tackled through his theatrical experimentations as well as ethics of communication. 
Um, I hope to show that、um, his queer ethos stems from his own、um, experience of living with AIDS, and his own,、um, particularly his own deep sense of intellectual duty for the historical present.、Um, this play, "Love Homosexual" in Chinese. Now, the homosexual wasn't misspelling. It was、um, his.、Uh, He coined that. It's a play on sens sensuality,、um, because、um, there's this、um, male beauty tradition in Chinese traditional Chinese culture. So he played on that. So that was the first gay play in Taiwan、um, a few years before the gay movement or the gay lesbian study took off in the 90s. Now the play deploys、uh, the book of poetry, which is a Confucian classic. Historically, operationalize it as the statecraft of civility. He used that as a poetic device to mediate、um, uh, moral education and、um, under the the Kuomintang national culture. So, for instance,、uh, the well-known love song from from the Book of Songs called the Reed is used. To allegorize the KMT region's hankering after its back of the U.S. Empire,、um, the whole play is is a demystification of national ideology.、Um, the play exposes、uh, the silencing of the sexual in school curricula, and also stage the erased tradition of male beauty through、uh, the Breton myth. myth Method of alienation, and he also critiqued Confucian morality, national subjectivity, as well as cultural development, de developmentalism. And the dialectical outcome of this critique、um, is manifested as a new love song of and by the people, and dedicated to the nation state. Um, a year later, he came up with the second play, which was a witness to the surge of social protest in the,、uh, along that time.、Um, and he wants to critique the arts role in the state remaking process under the sign of native nativization, which is inseparably linked since the late 70s to the rise of Chinese separatism. So he draws not only on Brecht but also on、uh, revolution upcross from Mao's、um, China、uh, Cultural Revolution. So it features a low-class entertainment dance group pantomizing the violence of Japanese mil militarism in the Brussels setting and the victorious and shameful national histori historiography. Of the Republic of China, which is Taiwan. Now, in the play, the prostitutes, farmers, laborers, the veterans from the Sino-Japanese wars and the Chinese Civil Wars are posited as the denigrated others of the aspiring nationalist subject in the making. And Tian Qiyuan's tactic、um, is what can be called anti-reticence. Sexuality、uh, that which is repressed by the party state returns in vengeance to affront bourgeois sensibility and、uh, also deconstruct liberal democracy.、Um, uh, at the end of the play,、uh, the playwright actually comes out of his own play to, st st stake, to stake his claim. In solidarity with the subalterns, he confronts the state with its massive moral failings,、um, but his sexual distance、um, is silenced in the end as the enemy from within. Now,、um, his early plays has a more kind of clashing style, and after two years of break,、um, when he went on teaching, he learned to appreciate.、Um, uh, Human potential, and also by his own illness, inspired by his doctor of traditional Chinese medicine, there was no treatment for AIDS at the time. 
um, he came to develop a performance method based on breathing, which is qi. So Ping Fang um, was the product of this um, this method. Uh, it's a nonverbal play that communicates with uh, the audience through confluence of energy flow generated from voices and body movement. Uh, the actress here told me that um, the night before performance, um, she was instructed to, when she uh, had sex with her boyfriend, the director said, feel your crotches, feel the energies there. Um, so this was just you know, part of this. I find that quite important. <laughs> Uh, and here comes the uh, Tianxuan's remake of the famous Chinese um, folk legend, the White Snake. Uh, Tianxuan's remake of this legend um, focuses on the conflict of desire within the Chinese cultural symbolic. And this is the old male cars. Uh, they are trained in the sea, in the sea to open up the central bodily spaces that previously in inhibited under martial law. Um, so you can see that the, the, the desires and conflict of, of uh, spirit wanting to become human and the, the husband um, dare not to face up his consequence, his desire, and the monk is uh, exposed as phony because uh, it contravenes uh, Buddhist teaching. And the green snake um, um, loved to hate, but that contradicted with her mistress' uh, desire. Um, I'm going to skip to this. Um, um, a couple of years later, um, Tian Xuan did an experiment of turning the uh, uh, using three actors pl to play four rules, um, which raise a really interesting question, because each actor spot performing body must carry or be burdened with any, at any given time the desire and contradic contradiction of two characters. And I see this as a kind of interesting way of um, working out conflicts um, because he doesn't believe in identity politics which is very, so it can end up very self-righteous. Um, he wants to, f he emphasized the, uh, 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 that people need to learn to respect each other, but respect can be enacted through that kind of experimentation by living with people's contradictions or trying to. Um, this is another remake of his um, um, Chinese folk um, cast a drama uh, where he discussed that, um, asked the audience to um, to think about good and evil. Um, this is because um, normalization for him kills certain texture of humanness. So he used the uh, um, bread. He draws down breath again to um, get the audience to face up to their, their own karma. Um, and this, um, I think it is very, um, this folk custom ethic is rooted in the Chinese principle of heaven, um, which, is, which forms the base entity of Chinese culture as it evolved in history. Um, and here's another play that um, is focused on the Taiwanese communism. Um, most of um, um, the work on Xie Xue Hong's um, socialism has been subsumed under nationalist histor histor historiography, but Tian um, takes on an uh, anti state stance and asks what Taiwan's post-cultural cult cult uh, subjectivity is. Uh, so you have uh, Japanese 
colonial violence dramatized through a kind of shaming laughter and the white terror um, under U.S. neo-colonialism. Uh, I want to finish this um, presentation by a note to this uh, 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 the gay marriage uh, sent. Um, senti sentimentalizing act um, which turned Tian Xiwen into a martyr of uh, the gay marriage movement. And this was a huge rally, uh, huge rally that, that took place uh, end, uh, last year. And I find it really ironic because uh, the pro gay marriage movement has become so self-purifying in its refusal to engage the stigma around sex and HIV. Whereas um, Tian Xiuyuan's theater of queer love insists on querying the sexual and the economic under capitalism and also question the presumed universality of liberal rights. Um, this is his eighth quilt. Uh, only one that's got carries its own name. Um, the stigma in Taiwan is so um, uh, deep that everyone use no one use uh, their real name except him. So his theater admits of uh, no self indulgence and victimhood, no resentment. Um, I think his uh, theatrical uh, practice constitutes a mode of effective activism, aiming to create possibility of fostering modern ethos of life that is autonomous and inclusive of others. Thank you. Um. We have about 10 minutes for questions, so I'll open it up to the floor. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks for all the uh, I have a question for Sati. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I wonder how much the previous time you the is ready to hear <laughs> your critique. Uh, I'm, a student, I'm a PhD student, so I think the music is uh, My name is Rebecca. Um, so I have a quick uh, few comments, and if you had any thoughts on that, uh, that would be um, So uh, just to talk, go back to the history part of your presentation, there's a lot of counter-narratives to uh, the fact that uh, the way we conceive of Hindustan in the music today um, is a very politicized Hindu um, concept uh, and we have dated back to the Buddhist basic structure and stuff was a very early 20th century phenomenon. Uh, so, like the work of John Kibok, the old woman, like, 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 so much of that. So, I wonder if you had any, any, anything to say about um, whether it's anti Muslim to a certain extent, this kind of discourse uh, of history. First of all, and the second uh, about your perspective of hearing, because I think it was very interesting. Um, and there's some work actually written uh, about it by Catherine Scofield at the um, King's College London, who's writing about medieval uh, music and masculinities and with the fluid sexuality that existed within, possibly existed in music circles more generally. Um, and also Dipe Shannon, who has written something about um, porno nationalism, what he calls, which is also very much associated with uh, the So just the Yeah. Uh, so thanks for your question. And uh, it is very right what you're saying. There is a counterfactual to this historical understanding. And that is why I think uh, the reason why I developed the story from the Vedic times and moved from 1500 BC is only to kind of establish the existence of music and how important or how ingrained it has been as part of in the culture of Indian subcontinent. However, there is, you're very right in saying that 
the music as we know now developed only in the period that you mentioned and the period that I talked of as well and that's why I specifically talked about the khayal music as being the dominant paradigm of Hindustani music now because there are still other styles of singing there's the trupad and there's the thumri and all of them have different themes and some are very devotional and some are very sensuous and very expressive of desire but I think the most dominant paradigm as you would probably agree is the khayal singing and that's why I wanted to focus on that and the compositions and the bandishes within that and uh, you're right the music community so to say completely denies this argument I have interviewed a couple of artists uh, very casually trying to bounce ideas and uh, I think that's where the God element argument came from because all they would all say is that well we're just singing for God we're never talking about sexuality we're never talking about desire we never talk about physical or emotional love so this is all devotional and uh, while for them and for the artists that may be true may not be true and that's something which is up for argument uh, so yeah I, I don't know whether I answered yeah, your yeah, question just, uh, just to say uh, last thing sorry um, about sexuality like nobody's going to ever speak of sexuality absolutely within the music absolutely like, absolutely yeah. but at the same time uh, if we look at this uh, politicized moment in history I would say about the police and all the politics people who mm. are doing what they're doing right there's a very strong right thing to do right uh, you know so like to use music as a tool mm. to, to create a religious to make it a religious right. phenomenon right so that implies a lot of a lot about sexuality it does well. it does it does yeah, yeah. of course thank you thank you um if you could, uh, for the questions, tell me your institutional affiliation and give us your name. Um, could I just respond to that? That was um, a thread that I noticed through these three papers that the, n the idea of the nation is a container and sometimes a very unstable or porous container um, for identity. And um, we heard in the last presentation how even the politics of identity can be a contested um, term for, for queerness. Um, sorry, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm Alberto from Central European University. My question is for uh, how many yeah. I was wondering how do you see the differences of modernity in Mulian versus his mother and how that normalization feels the textures that you were talking about? And maybe that is related to this reticence or reticent discourse that you mentioned and I wanted to know how do you understand that if you understand that using identity categories kind of uh, strengthen this homophobic cultural discourse or if by using identity categories that are pretty much western uh, Taiwanese artists can really uh, bring Taiwanese reality into visibility. So basically, the question is, what is the media versus his mother, and what, how do you understand versus her? Um, so, well, the first part of your question was, yeah. how do I, how do I see what? Yeah, you mentioned very quickly that in Mulian Brescius with mother, you see a critique of modernity, and you see there that normalization feels textures of humanity. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more on that, and how do you understand the great I, I think um, this is... I think this I can is probably... I can, th I can understand what Tian Qi Yuan uh, he learned that from teaching and having taught for several years myself I really began to see that I mean yes yeah, there's a lot of potentials in students and if you want to turn students into a certain way you kill off something in him or her um, and and I think this is what he wants to um, he sees that um, identity as a kind of, I think we know this from Facebook, you know, the kind of Facebook, same group of friends, and <laughs> um, this, um, 
never getting out of one circle. Uh, and he, but he, he knows that um, to co to coexist, um, you've got to understand each other and try to understand each other, which is why he, um, I think, did that experiment experiment with trying to get an actor to kind of perform two, con you know, the burden with two contradictions of, uh, of two people's, two dif different people's desires. And, but um, at the time, the these actors couldn't take up to the task. It's, and he didn't live long enough to kind of to develop further kind of uh, performing methods. I think we have time for one last question. Um, could I just? Yeah. yeah. Um, also, um, the second play, uh, we, we work that Chinese folk um, drama on the Buddhist monks uh, descending to hell to to save his mother tortured in hell. Um, and as I was saying, the um, the folk ethic was rooted in this uh, idea of the uh, the heavenly the heavenly principle, um, which is the kind of base entity in China, and I think that 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 kind of culture, that everyday um, practice, um, that cultural tradition has been kind of lived as a kind of daily, daily practice, help to well, give some space um, to the non-normal, um, as it doesn't, in the face of kind of, um, in the face of, of rap, uh, of normalization, or, uh, Particularly, particularly now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, I think it's going to have to uh, wait for later. Um, if you could join me in thanking our panelists for a reflection of papers.